Good evening, everyone, and welcome to OTF webinars. It's March 1st, 2018. Now it feels like the year's flying by, and what a better way to spend a cold, snowy, storm-ridden night than uh, enjoying a webinar presentation. Inquiry-based learning with your presenter, Derek Schellenberg. You're in for a treat tonight. I've taken a peek at the slides. We've got lots of great learning about to happen. So enjoy, and take it away, Derek. Thanks, Trish. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started. I hope you are all comfy and have your coffee or tea or whatever you need beside you as we get going. Um, I am a teacher at the York Region District School Board. I've been teaching for about 20 years. Uh, for the last 10 or so, my English department and I have been engrossed in trying to figure out how inquiry-based uh, learning works. And um, I'm excited to be in this webinar tonight. Trish is going to help me out. Once I get motoring, sometimes my attention to the chat box wanders a little bit. So please feel free to ask questions at any time. We will have a number of different stages throughout the webinar where there is interaction. And hopefully you can jump in and ask me questions or contribute your own learning, etc. So we're going to get going. And we're going to start with um, you might notice that I'm at sort of a BYOD school, so every kid brings their laptop every day to every class. So I've tried to infuse the session with some web tools, some of which you may be familiar with, some of which you may not. So what I'd like you to do initially is to attempt to use this Google form. And what's going to happen here is it's going to ask you some questions. So basically what I'm trying to check is what's our prior knowledge? What's our interest in inquiry? And um, keep in mind a couple things. One, the results are going to be anonymous. But two, you're going to be able to see everybody else in terms of their input. So we just want to keep that in mind in terms of if there's things you want to share, great. And if things you don't want to share, that's great too. So you can do one of two things. You can either type in the link that's in the screen here, bit.ly prior inquiry, or you can access it through the chat box. Trish has provided the link, so bit.ly prior inquiry, and we'll go to the Google form. So I'm going to go to the Google form in my screen, and hopefully you can go there in yours. So I'm just going to share my screen. And we're going to take a quick look at the Google form, and it starts with this as the initial slide. So it's just asking some information in terms of whether you're elementary, secondary, consultant, e-learning contact, or something else. So if I was filling out the form, I would click secondary teacher, and I would go next. And there's a couple questions here. And what I'd like you not to do for now is don't worry about the video. We can always come back to the video later. As Trish said, you'll have access to all of the resources, so you can go back and take a look. But if you could fill out some of the questions, keeping in mind that when there's a little red asterisk beside the question, it's mandatory. If you don't want to answer it, that's fine. We just click X or maybe NA, and that's fine if you think the question is not applicable to you. So we keep going. We click Next. Then there's a little chart. If you do this, you do have to choose something for each of them. So it's kind of checking your readiness in terms of inquiry. What have you tried? Um, what are you aware of? That sort of thing. When we get to the bottom, there's three different pages. We're going to click Submit. So because I haven't clicked every location on the third page, it asked me to go back. And so now I can submit my results. So you're taking a couple seconds to do it. Um, I'm assuming some of us have used Google Form before. Some people may not. This is a fantastic tool. Um, a couple of the things that it can do that are relatively new, one you've already seen, you can embed videos within it. So if you're exploring the flipped classroom, it might be a great place to start. And then the second thing that it can do relatively recently in the last year is you can create quizzes with it. And with multiple choice, um, the drop-down menu, there's three types of questions it will auto-mark the quizzes. So I use quizzes uh, every week with my e-learning class, which I teach online. And it's just a quick way to check to see 
if they're getting the main ideas that we're attempting to learn. So the other link that was on that slide was the Google Sheets, and that is where all your responses are being populated. So hopefully you can see on my screen, a few people have already posted their responses, which is great. So this is, if you have an LCD projector in your class, this is a great way to sort of share what the students are responding to. And again, you just want to be transparent with them in terms of if their responses are going to be shared, um, that they know that up front. So they're not sharing anything that they wouldn't be comfortable with. The nice thing about this tool is if they've logged in to use it, you can collect their um, login as well. Okay, so it's not totally anonymous if you don't want it to be. When I use it in my school, the students have to log in so I can see all their student numbers. So that sometimes helps, as opposed to some of these anonymous tools we're going to look at later, where um, students can put in whatever they want and you're not aware of which student um, did it. So we've got a mixture here of secondary and elementary teachers so far. Looks like about seven people have responded, which is great. And then we've got some different definitions for inquiry. So inquiry means having students pose questions, and that's going to be key to tonight's session. Again, we have asking questions. I love this, search for knowledge. That's really important. And then we have student interests. So that's a fantastic way you can bring inquiry in and hopefully increase engagement. We've got deep questions to guide their learning. And I think one of the challenges as we sort of attempt to implement inquiry in our classroom is who generates those questions? Who's in charge of them? Um, and hopefully at some point we can shift to students being the ones that are generating them. Knowledge developed, great. Um, so sometimes they call this sort of constructivism. So the students are gathering and constructing the knowledge. And we've got some other great responses coming in. Another way that I can share these responses back to whoever completed the survey is I go to the Google form and I go to the responses. And it's helpful with some types of responses because it turns them into graphs, whether it's a bar graph or a pie chart, et cetera. So here we have our group so far. 13 people have responded. We've got our open-ended questions. And then down here, we've got the questions where people were evaluating themselves where they are on the continuum in terms of their comfort level with inquiry. So that's fantastic. That gives me a great uh, place to start in terms of where we're at. And you can access these results as well. Trish has placed them in the chat box. So I'm going to go back to um, the room. And I'm going to stop sharing here. It's okay, Julie, if you're late. You're not in trouble. There's no detention afterwards. So, yeah. So, Trish, can I get you to pull me back into it? Beautiful. Okay. So, thanks, guys, for participating in that. And as I said before, you get to see the results, which is fantastic. So this is a little overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. And you'll notice Mr. Schellenberg, who likes to talk about himself in the third person, has subtly used questions for each of the phases of tonight's little webinar. So we've got what is it, attempting to define it. We're going to look at some different inquiry models, um, a rationale in terms of why should educators embrace inquiry, but I'm assuming if you've invested 90 minutes tonight, you're already somewhat sold on this. How can it be adopted in your class? How do you construct an inquiry question, which I think is a great place to start? How do you design in terms of bringing it into your classroom? And then some resources for you to check out after the session is over. Okay, so we've got four quotes here. I'm going to read them. And what I'm hoping you'll do is pick one of them and give your thoughts or response to them, ideally in the chat box. Um, but I'll read them, and if you want to respond to some of them, and then I'll sort of share where I come from with these quotes. 
So in the first one here in the top left, it says, I keep the subject of my inquiry constantly before me and wait till the first dawning opens gradually by little and little into a full and clear light. And it's interesting because, you know, Isaac Newton, I'm thinking of science, and yet it feels like something that would appeal to the English teacher and me. So that's the first quote. Then we've got to the right here, the world is but a school of inquiry, which we'll talk about in a second. We only think when we're confronted with problems. Interesting. You might agree, you might disagree in the bottom left. And then in the bottom right, every thinker puts some portion of an apparently stable world in peril, and no one can wholly predict what will emerge in its place. And this is John Dewey talking about inquiry. So what I'm hoping is that you'll take a couple seconds and type your thoughts or responses to any of these positive, negative, agree, disagree. I'm not sure what the heck that quote means. Whatever you want. Thanks, Caitlin. What made you more, you know, what made you more appealing in terms of the second quote? That was a beautifully worded question there on my part. So we've got here, as different people are processing, um, for me, in the top left, I think the intent is that we get kids addicted to whatever they want to inquire into, and then that drives their learning. Caitlin's response, it highlights the value of questioning what we already know, which is fantastic. What's interesting to me is in this bottom right, I think there's a letting go for teachers in terms of my stable world where I control everything. I'm giving a, a degree of control to the students. And I, I think that's a challenge for us as teachers to sometimes give control to them, let them drive the bus. Yep, we only think when we're confronted with problems is interesting. The world is but a school of inquiry. Yes, and that's what we want. I mean, as an English teacher, I want lifelong readers, but I also want lifelong learners. And I wonder, with the top right one, is school a world of inquiry, or is it the world outside of school? that's the source of inquiry for the kids. So that's an interesting challenge. And, um, and I think some people would agree or disagree with the bottom left in terms of we only think when we're confronted with problems. But I think problems, challenges, questions are hopefully what drives inquiry. So we're going to keep going. This is not one of my two sons. Thank you, everybody, for your thoughts in terms of the chat box. Um, but this is an experience that I had with my second son. They're now 14 and 11, both of them madly doing homework for tomorrow. But in that visit to the doctor's office where it was more of a, you know, does this work, does that work, does this work, the interesting thing to me was most of it was about, you know, how is he doing with sight? Is he walking yet? Is he doing this? Is he doing that? But this question caught me off guard when the doctor asked it does he ask a lot of questions and really made me think in terms of, you know, what are the expectations for a child at a certain age? Obviously, he was talking at that point, and with our second son, for sure, I could answer yes. He does ask a lot of questions. So it was interesting to me in terms of the doctor actually asking that question, and it made me think about this. So what is this assumption or expectation we have about children. I believe this is called wait time, but what's the assumption or expectation we have about children? And I think part of the answer is that we hope, we believe, we think that students are, not students, that children are naturally curious. Okay, so that's sort of that premise that we have. And now I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I'm sure wherever you are across Ontario, whether you're hooked into the internet or within your board or whatever, we hear different criticisms both of our education system and the American education system. Caitlin's already given her answer there. It kills curiosity. One other challenge is, is this idea of competing, right? We're competing in terms of their engagement. How do you compete with 
this video game that they're playing at home? How do you compete with the addiction to uh, cell phone, you know, texting, that sort of thing? So we face interesting challenges. For me, when I want to get inspiration in terms of learning, school system, education, etc., I don't know about you, but where I often go is to TED. And I'm sure some of you have seen some of these talks that have been delivered. The one in the middle about creativity is actually the most popular TED talk ever. And um, this is where I go, and I also try to bring these. We watched one, I think it was yesterday, and it was about grit, this idea of needing grit to persevere with so much anxiety, so much stress, that sort of thing, that grit's an essential thing for someone to be successful. In the bottom, we have these other criticisms. So there are obviously some sort of focus in terms of some American schools. Yes, Angela Lee Duckworth, Jennifer, absolutely. Her talk on grit is about six minutes long. Fantastic. I think there's also a book. Um, so we have criticisms that might be the American school system. Around Sir Ken, these other talks focus on similar things to what Sir Ken is focusing on in terms of criticisms, but these are reinterpretations of what the school system could look like. So on the left here, we've got Sugata, Sugata Mitra, I believe, and he's talking about the ability for kids to actually teach themselves which I think is a super powerful strategy. We've got uh, Salman Khan in the top left. He runs the Khan Academy, which is fantastic. And it has free videos, primarily dealing with math and science, okay, that kids can, again, teach themselves, whether they're moving ahead, trying to get caught up, etc. This one about this kindergarten, I believe it's in Japan, is fantastic, the actual design of the school. Then we've got Giver Tully over here, Lessons Through Tinkering, and it's his initial message is basically give kids tools. I think he might even go so far as to say give kids power tools. And, of course, you're teaching them how to use them, but this idea that they make mistakes, they can build what they want, all these wonderful things. And then over here on the right, we have skateboarding and this idea that why do we only give kids one opportunity to demonstrate learning? As opposed to when we actually learn outside of school, we take as much time as we need to to master that skill. So that's a challenge in terms of if you're going to bring that thinking into your classroom, this idea of multiple opportunities to demonstrate learning. And then again, in the bottom right, we have this idea of the student-centered learning, student-centered classroom. So there's some interesting ideas here, some of which are going to be relevant to what we're talking about in terms of inquiry. So what we're going to look at um, very quickly is a number of years back, I went to a think tank. It was in summer. There was 20, 25 people, and it was all focused on inquiry, and people were sharing what they did, and then we were trying to build a model for our board in terms of what inquiry looked like, and then eventually there were resources that were constructed. And where we started was all these different inquiry models that were being used both in Canada, Ontario, Alberta, other places, and around the world. And I think it'll be pretty obvious when we look at them quickly that you'll see common factors between all these different models. And some of the ones I picked are, are more recent. So if we just go to the first one, try to start with something super simplistic, okay? We start at the top. We've got this idea of questioning, I'm wondering about something, and we have four additional phases. So I'm reading and learning, so I'm interacting with some texts. I'm looking and listening. I might be at the gathering phase at that point. Then in number four, I'm going to analyze and interpret the data, and maybe I throw some of it out, and data will look different depending on what grade level or subject area you're in. And then lastly, what I think is really, really an important part of it is how are we going to share, is this group, is this individual, is this whole class, and how are we going to plan? And then you'll notice, of course, I think an essential part is that the arrow goes back to number one. So super simple model here, and we keep going. 
And I'm sure you see that there's parallels between model one and model two. It again starts at the top. And we move around. We have retrieving, processing, creating, sharing, and we have evaluating. Yeah, and I love what you're saying, Kinga. Constant evaluation and reevaluation. And I'm thinking this is what we want the students to do, but I'm assuming this is what we're doing as teachers with our own teaching, with our own units, with our own assignments, with our own courses. I'm reevaluating that worked, that didn't work. I have to change that. I have to redesign this. So reflecting on the process in the middle is obviously an essential part of being pre-process. So again, starting at the top, we move through. We have reflect. I like this I try. And you'll notice in most models up here in sort of that initial stage, they have the idea of questions or potentially starting with problems. Maybe you're attempting to do both. There's a lot of them. Again, we have question. This felt a little bit more sciencey in terms of creating a hypothesis. I think the challenge for myself in English, there's two challenges. One, sometimes their questions are things where they think they know the answer already. So I don't think that's a full increase that we're hoping for. And then secondly, they don't gather enough evidence sometimes to be able to discard to be able to form a real opinion. So what happens is they're only identifying evidence that's going to confirm the belief they have at the beginning of the inquiry. So we want to try to avoid those things if possible. Again, we have another model starting at the top. And this starts with prior knowledge. And then we go around, and we have making conclusions. And I like this. It's a little bit of more of a social version, so taking action, maybe to deal with that problem. And then I think this is my favorite. So we have exploring here at the top. We have choosing the topic, developing questions. And again, my suggestion would be, while well, you might want to model the process with your kids, hopefully you can get them to a place where they're the ones that are making all the key decisions. So choosing the topic, developing the questions. Then we have investigating, coming up with their plan. Then we have processing whatever information they do find. And then lastly, we had the creation. So what are they making? How are they sharing it? That sort of thing. And I think that's really the big payoff for them when they get to share it with their peers. It shouldn't be, you know, I think it's even kind of sad sometimes if I'm the only one who gets to look at what they create. So it needs an audience. We need to find audiences for our student work. Okay. So we've looked at a number of different models. And I think we saw commonalities between all of them. So we're going to play with another tool really quickly. It's called Answer Garden. It takes about five seconds to set up. And what I would ask with this Answer Garden is that um, when you type in your response, don't type in a sentence. Okay? So what I'm looking for is one word that you think is a criteria or a characteristic of inquiry. If you want to put in five, that's fine. Just hit enter and type the next one and enter and type the next one, and then you'll see what happens as a result. So we're going to put the link for you in the little chat box. So let's see here. Oh, yeah. So Trish has already done it. Fantastic. Um, so grab that link and go there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. And you'll see, if we have multiple people attempting this, um, what happens as answers are placed in. So I'm going to share my screen here. And you can access the link at the bottom left in the chat box. And hopefully you can see what I can see, which it looks like you can. So what are characteristics of inquiry? For me, one of the first ones I noticed, which some people commented on in the chat box, was cyclical. And we've got curiosity here. And if I click on each word, you can see how many people have come up with that word. So what's awesome about this tool is that it aggregates the data. 
and it'll identify how many people. Now, I had perseverance today, or not today, this week with my students. I think it was in grade nine. And unfortunately, I had three different spellings of the word. So they didn't all combine nicely. I had perseverance with an A here and then with an E in the wrong place. And so it didn't look as nice. But it looks like we're good in terms of spelling. So everybody's functioning at a level four here. So we've got cyclical, self-selected, curriculum aligned. That's essential. We can't forget the curriculum. Uh, Interest-focused, student-centered, that's key. Authentic, discovery, choice, and exploration. And I think a challenge that, um, or a balancing act that some of us will have is I want to build in time for inquiry. I want them to go deep into a topic. And then I want to make sure that I'm covering what I think is my essential curriculum. And so for some people, they think that inquiry might involve some sort of trade-off. I disagree. I think we can still be rigorous in terms of attending to all our curriculum expectations while we're using inquiry. And I think the advantage is we can go deep as opposed to staying on the surface with the topic. So this is Answer Garden. It's quick and easy to use. Can anybody tell me what the downside is of it? Anyone want to throw in their opinion as to what the problem might be with this tool? Right, Melanie. Okay, so we have no control over the responses. Anonymous, kids could be rude. Exactly. Now, what you can do is you can, you can just click on the moderator option, and then the rude response um, won't pop up. None of the responses will pop up, and you have to individually okay them. So this wouldn't be a tool I would use necessarily on day one with my students, but after a week or two, uh, I'm comfortable with them in terms of their responses. Occasionally we had a silly response, um, but that's fine. Now the other thing that I would do is if my students gave all those responses, and tomorrow we're generating uh, possible artifacts for Genius Hour, for example, I take a screenshot, and then, then I've captured the information. Because that data, because of the way it's sort of aggregated, I can't collect it any other way. So if I, at least if I have a screenshot, we can collect all the great stuff that the kids came up with, okay? Yeah, initially it may lead to frustration, and you do have to give, give kids instructions in terms of the tool. Some of them will want to write a sentence, and then all their individual words pop up in different places. Okay, so we've got some characteristics of inquiry. So we're going to keep going, and we're here at Bloom's Taxonomy, and I just wanted to focus on this shift. 2001, I had only been teaching for a couple years at that point. And we see this shift from nouns on the left to verbs on the right. And I think, obviously, with inquiry and some of these you know, models of learning that we're talking about, we want to get up to this opportunity of analyzing, evaluating, and creating. I think it's interesting in terms of the idea that synthesis has transformed into creation and it's now at the top. And then evaluation, which in inquiry might be evaluation of the data, evaluation of whatever proof they're gathering. So for English, it might be evidence from the text. It might be quotations, that sort of thing. For speeches that we were doing this week, it might be statistics as well. Um, and then we get up to this create model at the top. And, yeah, I think remember makes it very well known what the bottom is. <laughs> yeah. So... I think these at the bottom are still important. Obviously, we want the kids to be able to understand the information, and you can see they're much bigger in terms of the slice. But uh, hopefully at some point in each of our units, we can attempt to get up to create. We certainly, with our assessment tasks, try for each one of them to get up to analysis, evaluation, and creation. In my particular class, some of them, we don't have any tests, for example. Everything has sort of got this project orientation to it. So another thing um, that we can look at here, and I apologize for the size of it. You can access it later on your own. But um, I believe this is a picture of the actual photocopy. So if I make it too big, it actually lose the ability to see everything. But what we have here is called Heart Splatter Student Engagement. 
And in this bottom area here, we've got degrees of non-engagement. So they call it disengagement and marginalization. And at the very bottom, level one, adults make the decisions. Teachers are in charge of the decisions. I can use the pointer tool. Okay. Um, yes. So, okay. We'll, we'll, we won't worry about the pointer tool. But thank you, Trish. Um, so, yes, at the bottom we have adults make the, the difference. Maybe I'll just place a little sun there. There you go. And then what we aspire to, I think, in our classes is obviously we want to increase the degrees of engagement. So we've got voice here. And then what we love uh, in our department is choice. And that choice could involve choice of text, choice of topic that they're going to explore, and then, of course, their questions. They come up with the inquiry questions they want to explore. And I think the great thing about that is we want to give them the freedom to let that evolve over time so it's, we don't look at it as something fixed. Uh, and then, ultimately, we want to get up to the top, and that's leadership. And it's student-led decisions. And they're sharing with adults. And I think this is where we have this gradual release of responsibility and the students are making the key decisions, and the students are teaching students, and you actually fade into the background, you're off to the side, and that's when amazing things happen. And in reality, we can't do this all the time, and we probably don't want to. But this is a real opportunity, and with some of our assessment tasks, that's what we build towards. How much voice, choice, and leadership opportunity can we give students? So it's something to experiment with, and I think it takes a shift in mindset on the part of the teacher. I'm giving up control of my classroom. I'm not going to force everybody to read Great Gatsby or Lord of the Flies or Catcher in the Rye anymore, whether I liked them or not in high school. I think mostly I did. Um, but I need to shift those aside and let students choose the major things, such as the text they want to read. So this is heart splatter student engagement. So moving on, we've got a number of different um, models for learning that are popular these days. And again, going back to those four quotes that we looked at at the beginning of tonight's session, John Dewey is not new. And Michel de Montaigne, which I'm sure I just mangled his name, his quote is from 1533. So the idea of inquiry-based learning being something new is not true. But I think what we're acknowledging here is kids are curious. Kids want to pursue their interests in something. So this is a model that can work. And it doesn't matter whether it's the 19th century, the 20th century, or the 21st century. We have some other models here, problem-based learning, project-based learning. Coding is obviously very popular these days. Maker spaces was kind of popular the last five years as well. Maybe it'll continue to be popular at our school. In secondary, I think we're a little slow off the mark here. We're trying to design flexible classrooms, whereas I'm sure a lot of you elementary teachers have a flexible classroom already in terms of multiple types of seating, multiple places where students can do things and maybe even give them choice in terms of what they want to do when. And then this is just a, a concept that I love and I mentioned it a couple times already, learning by teaching. And what I mean by that is we had one of our consultants who eventually came back into my English department. And what she said was, when you're up in front of the kids and you're doing all the talking, which is kind of like what I'm doing currently, you're the one that's doing the learning. You're doing the majority of the learning. Yes, they might be getting some things from you, but it's when students have the opportunity to teach, they have the opportunity to lead, that's when they can really deepen their understanding of something. As they're sort of explaining and thinking their way through the process, that's where they get to demonstrate um, how much they know and, and deepen that understanding. So what do these educational models have in common from the previous slide? So we've got lots of different models. Does anybody have any thoughts about what they have in common? Might not be between all of them, 
but what might be some of the things they have in common between some of them. Does anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, I love those. So we've got not lecture-based, constructivism, student responsibilities. I love that, Kinga. So driven by student discussion. It's fantastic. So there's four different characteristics of some of these models. Here are some other ones. Okay, with some of them, we have students asking one or more questions. This idea that we present students with a problem or challenge. I don't know if any of you have explored Breakout EDU, where you turn your classroom into a escape room, but that's essentially what that is. You present a problem or challenge to them, and they have to then solve it, either individually or working in a group. We've got that cyclical again, student-centered, teacher as guide, collaborative. I mentioned with Heart Flatter, this release of responsibility, and I love this students discovering the curriculum. So it's just like with good writing, we don't want to tell people, we want them to, we want to show them, or we want them to discover it for themselves. For them to make that initial light bulb moment, as opposed to me telling them, which is so boring. High level of student engagement, and then we want this intersection, okay? So student interests, curriculum, and the world. So we really need to focus on not what's interesting to me, they don't want to be talking about soccer every day. What's interesting to them? Okay, so I went for a walk in terms of this whole inquiry thing and was trying to find examples outside of my English office in terms of other areas of the school where we see inquiry-based learning. That's fantastic, Sherilyn. That idea of sort of connecting to the curriculum is great. The big ideas and inquiry questions, they probably can take I don't know about your document, but my English document kind of looks mundane, and then they can turn it into something fantastic and intriguing. What my grade 12 U team is doing is, for certain assignments, the kids are choosing which curriculum expectations they want to be evaluated on for that particular assignment, which is interesting. It forces the kids to be knowledgeable about how they're being evaluated and make some great choices. But I love this idea. So, when I walked around the school, this is what I saw. In the science department, one of our physics teachers has this great activity, and what he does is he says, you're a prisoner, you're on Alcatraz, you're trying to escape, ideally you'd like not to die when you escape. So we're not gonna factor the guards or anything into this, um, not that there are any currently on Alcatraz, but what the students have to calculate is um, the distance and how fast they have to swim so they're not swept out, you know, into the ocean and die. So how fast they have to swim to get to the, um, you know, where the land is, away from the island. So I thought that was really cool. And what he does is he provides them some current links in terms of the weather on Alcatraz at that day. And so they can access them and factor that into, you know, whatever they're doing in terms of vectors and calculation as they swim towards land. So hopefully most of them survive that process. Then when I went to the math department, um, one of the cool activities that they do or inquire into is designing an amusement park. And for this, primarily they're focusing on you know, a certain amount of land, and then what rides do I need? And then they start thinking about things like area and perimeter and that sort of thing, and they would sort of design what type of things they're gonna have, how many they can have, where's the food place is gonna be, where's the washrooms, where's the roller coaster, et cetera. So the kids love these kind of activities. Um, and I think it would be sort of synthesis of what you've taught them during the unit, so they have an opportunity to apply that. Sometimes it's a group, sometimes it's an individual activity. And then the same teacher has another activity I loved even more, even though I worked at a golf course for 10 years and only golfed about two times in total, and that was for the kids to design an 18-hole golf course, complete with sand traps, you know, 
three par, four par, five par holes, and the kids design them, and then as the summative task at the end, I think that the actual design of the golf course is the summative task, but as the fun thing that they do at the end of the unit is you have to golf through somebody else's course. So you have to map out your shots in terms of length and tangent and all this sort of stuff um, to navigate their course. So a really cool activity, kind of fun. I think Inquiry is fantastic in that it can be applied to anything. And again, here, they're applying concepts that they would learn throughout the unit, and it would probably, again, be things like perimeter, area, et cetera. I don't know if he factors in wind, but that would be cool as well. Okay, so there's some some models that were from our school um, that connect to certain aspects of inquiry. And these were the criteria that I pulled out of them in terms of what I thought made them interesting for the students. So again, we have real world connections. So I think that's a challenge for math. Sometimes we get into this just focusing on doing problems, doing problems, doing problems, and it's much more memorable if there's that real world connection. And then we're attempting to peak student interests. The accessing current resources makes it even more authentic. Again, as we had before, this idea of connecting to our curriculum expectations. I can't just be inquiring without having any connection. Otherwise, what the heck am I doing? And I think these are some other things to keep in mind. Students start in different places. You're not attempting to fool them, but students get lost in the whole playing, designing, wrapping their mind around it, and it's not sitting there going, I have to work through 20 word problems or answer four questions about this chapter. So I think that that increases the engagement level. You can factor in collaboration, communication, and role taking within the group. And then this idea of I provide instruction at the beginning, and then the kids run with it. And again, I can sort of rove around the class and help or give suggestions or maybe not answer. Maybe answer their question with the question that directs them to where they should be going in terms of their thinking, as opposed to just helping them along the way by holding their hand. And as we've already mentioned, it's the idea of student-centered learning as opposed to teacher-centered teaching. Okay. So... One of the things that this webinar was supposed to focus on was this idea of if I'm going to bring inquiry into my classroom, where could I start? So we've got a number of different options here, some of which we're going to talk about tonight. So at the bottom we have um, designing a unit of study with inquiry in mind. Uh, obviously, again, we keep coming back to curriculum expectations. If you want to start small, you could design a lesson or a couple lessons where we're doing a little inquiry. Student interest is big. And then what I think are the two biggest things here to keep in mind are this enduring understanding and the inquiry questions. And lots of people mentioned them already, um, especially the inquiry questions idea. So that, again, could be designed by the teacher or the student. But enduring understanding is this concept of when I leave this unit, when I leave this course, what do I want my students to know? What's the absolute key aspect of the course that I want them to be able to take with them outside of the classroom, whether it's to the next grade or a different subject area or whatever? So that's a tricky thing in terms of thinking about what's essential. You know, am I focusing on, you know, specific aspects of my, my curriculum? Am I focusing on citizenship? It depends on your subject area and your grade, absolutely. So moving on, we're going to focus now on the whole question thing. So my question for you is we've got these two concepts, which we may be somewhat familiar or not so familiar with. Close-ended questions on the left, open-ended questions on the right. What's the difference between the answers to closed-ended questions versus open-ended questions? This is an opportunity for people to chime in. I love that. Can it be Googled? We had a presentation another English department did, and that was their test. Open-ended questions require students to justify their reasons. Okay. So we need some sort of evidence to support our responses. 
love it. That feeds can get with this whole cyclical idea that we want to keep pursuing the inquiry. So questions lead to more new questions. Genius Hour works like that. Open-ended questions encourage students to think deeper. So that's fantastic, Shelley. Close-ended questions focus on, sorry, went up a little bit there. Um, focus on the end product number while well, open-ended questions focus on a process. I love that. And we've got open-ended questions are qualitative, descriptive, richer, and this is key, Caitlin. That's fantastic. So that's what we want. Why, how, in terms of our open-ended questions. So that's great in terms of helping us come up with questions. And again, you're going to want to model this process before you throw kids in the deep end and they have to construct their own questions. So going along with some of your answers, closed-end questions sometimes can be answers with a yes or a no. Sometimes it's a fact. What school do you go to? Not really an open-ended question. It's closed because there's only one answer. Um, open-ended questions, as you said, require more thought, a longer response. And what we're trying to get into with at least in my subject area in English, is open-ended inquiry questions where there's multiple possible answers. We can have a discussion. We can argue about it. We can explore these different possibilities. So this is simplified, and you can definitely come up with arguments uh, in terms of this interpretation. But closed-ended questions often start with a verb. So you know, do you like chocolate? The answer is yes or no. When my students ask questions like this, I find that they naturally just put the word why at the end of their question. Do you like this? Why? Do you do this? Explain. And that's fine. Um, and you can come up with good questions that do start with verbs, but a lot of these questions end with a yes or a no response. Over on the right here with our open-ended questions, as we had from Caitlin, why and how are big, and what can also be useful. You notice I've got those highlighted as opposed to who, where, and when. You can have great questions that start with who, where, and when. You can also have closed ones. You know, who killed the person at the beginning of the movie? That's going to be closed. Who is a good role model? That could be a fantastic uh, inquiry for your students to explore. What makes a good role model? Who makes a good role model, et cetera. So again, things to consider, and depending on your subject area, you might stay away from certain words, okay? But you definitely want to explore this with the kids, come up with examples, and maybe show them your thought process in terms of what makes a good inquiry question. And the other thing that I mentioned before is the expectation should be the comfort level with changing the question as they go through their inquiry. So my kids usually start with questions, and they never finish with the same question. So this is called a question matrix. And it is a useful tool if you want to sort of introduce inquiry questions to your class, or any type of questions for that matter. Um, in the top, we've got, we start off with questions like is and does. We move to can, and that focuses on possibility. And we might use in English class or language arts classes this can, should, would, could, will, or might for kids to sort of project forward. So maybe they're making predictions. Maybe they're guessing as to what's going to come next in a text. And hopefully that increases their engagement level in terms of confirming their suspicions and how do they support the reason why they think that this foreshadows what's going to come later in the text. For our inquiry questions, um, with my students, we usually focus more on the left-hand side. And although what's right here at the top, which it suggests that it's simple, I think you can come up with good inquiry questions that start with what. But we also, as Caitlin said, use primarily why and how. Now, if you want, as this question matrix is attempting to suggest, we can combine them. So we go, why is, you know, a butterfly multicolored? You know, how does an insect fly? 
So we can combine our questions down the left-hand column with ones down the right. So this is, again, a tool I explored it a little bit with my grade 12s um, last semester, and it was useful for them. So what we explored is the idea of placing a topic, and it could be a topic they choose or from a text they're reading. They propose the topic, and then they come up with different questions here. And then they ultimately choose which questions they would like to explore further as we go deeper into the book or possibly as we engage in research about that specific topic that they've pulled from the book. So it was an interesting experiment. I didn't tell them, of course, I need you to come up with um, 7 times 7, 49 questions. You know, we might have done 5 or 10. And then they picked the ones that they really loved. And I think it's always a good idea with um, these kind of strategies for, again, you to model it, but also for the kids to see what the other kids are coming up with. Some people are going to find it easy to interact with. Other people may take time, and it's nice to see what their neighbors are doing, and that gives them the belief that they can also do the same thing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to grab this link here, and it's um, bit.ly IQ questions. It's going to pop up in the left chat box in this little bit. And we're going to use a tool that I think some of you have probably heard of, probably used. It's called a Padlet. It has similarities to Answer Garden and also differences. And what I'm going to ask you to do is come up with some closed questions related to what you teach and some open-ended questions. And the real trick which I struggle with is, can you come up with a question that would be intriguing for your students, that would make them curious, that would pique their interest in a topic? So we're going to go there now, and we can just go. Yep, so there it is, beautiful, in the bottom. So you can click on that link. And I will share my screen again. I've placed some open-ended and closed questions on the Padlet already. I'm hoping you can come up with better examples for your subject area or grade than I came up with for mine. So we're just going to go to the Padlet now. And here we are. And so you can... To use Padlet, you can either click on the plus bottom on the bottom right, or you can double click anywhere on the screen. So I love this tool. I'm actually using it almost on a weekly basis with all of my classes, except for my e-learning classes, because I don't get to physically see them at all. But it's amazing because students get to see what other students are writing. And just like Caitlin and Ann have already done, I ask them to put their name so I can give credit for their work in the title, sometimes in brackets, sometimes after their title, whatever, but something. And then, again, we have that accountability piece. And we can, um, I believe, moderate these questions as well. I usually don't, but we can. So Caitlin and Ann are working on possible questions, which is great. If other people want to join us, that's fantastic. So what I've done is created four or five closed and four or five open-ended. And with my closed, most of them I've started with uh, verbs. So we have is, we have are, and we have does. Okay? So is she a student? Not going to be great for inquiry because it's going to lead to somebody saying, yes, she's a student, or no, she's not a student. Similarly, my other highlighted example, how old are you? Even though it's not a yes, no question, it's still closed. The person is 15, the person is 23, the person is 47. So there's a definitive answer, so not great for inquiry. These other ones, our role model is important. Does a university education lead to a better future? When does a person become an adult? Could actually be an effective question to explore. So again, while we want to teach them about you know, use of verbs and focus on why, how, or what as ideal words to start inquiry questions. We can still come up with good questions, 
um, using other types of questioning words. So those are some options. In terms of open-ended questions at the bottom here, using the how, why, and what, we've got connected to our grade 12 course theme, how does something survive the test of time? Uh, grade 11, still exploring Shakespeare. Some people might think that's good or bad. Why did the witches share the prophecies with Macbeth? So we could use that as a guiding question to explore the entire play. And then lastly, I'm sure a question that my students love. What is a thesis? I'm sure they spend hours inquiring into that topic. So hopefully you could come up with a better question, more likely to pique your kids' curiosity than what is a thesis. We have Scott, looks like he teaches grade 12 philosophy. I'm sure philosophy has some amazing questions that they explore. Um, in fact, your whole course could be built around questions. And then we have Caitlin here with 9 to 12, English and social science and philosophy. Oh, they're going to talk later, Caitlin and Scott. And we've got, for closed questions, when did positiv positivism, it's tough for me to pronounce, develop? So that might be closed if it's a certain time period or era. What's the definition of argument? Probably still could have a healthy discussion about it, but it is more closed than some. In terms of Caitlin's other open-ended, we've got why did positivism, she might me pronounce that again, develop when it did. So we could look at cause and effect, different things, what social transformation spurred it and how. And then I like this. So we're doing that extending. Develop an argument and identify the premises and conclusion. Fantastic. And Scott's formulating this beautiful question here. And we've got another anonymous person here in the Padlet coming up with questions. So maybe I'll give you guys a minute or two to add some more. In terms of Padlet, I'll just talk briefly about the web tool before we keep going. Um, so this doesn't take long to set up. You choose a couple things. You choose the background. You choose the little icon on the left. You provide instructions at the top, so mine simply say inquiry questions and put your name, et cetera. And now they have about five or six different formats for Padlet. So one's called Brick. Um, another one allows them to post anywhere. I usually don't use it because you get people overlapping each other. Um, and you could also use it as a back channel where it's one post on top of the other on top of the other. They also have the feature in Padlet now where you can post and actually connect to another post. So you could kind of use it for brainstorming, to show research. And one thing that people can play with when they use Padlet is the ability to add links, add videos, and add images. I warn you about images, not because my kids make bad choices, but sometimes when they choose an image that's really huge in size, it can impact all the posts. One other thing is when you use Padlet, unlike what I've done today, I would make any new post go last. So that would let my post that's now blue and on the right here, it would let it stay in that home position. And that makes it easier when you want to talk to what the students have done and students are still writing. So you make any new post last and then things don't move around on you, and then you can't find the post that you were talking about. Anyways, Padlet's a super easy tool to use, and um, my kids were actually talking today that they prefer it to something like Google Form where you can't see other people's responses, and we leave them up so kids can go back later, and if they want to borrow somebody else's idea, they can. So just going back to what we've got so far, we've got Scott, what would Aristotle say to Plato to explain why he's creating his own school? So a closed question, but could come up with some amazing responses. And then we've got, would you prefer to learn at Plato's Academy or Aristotle's Lycée? I'm going to assume that's the pronunciation. I'm probably wrong. But they sound like fantastic questions. We've got Sam, open-ended. How can we make Canada a better place to live? Love it. Kids would love exploring. You get amazing answers from kids from that question. What lessons can we learn from learning about the past? That could lead to an amazing inquiry. 
We've got Lori, what is the United Nations? Again, closed question, but it might be something important that we need to know. Sometimes we sort of, in a inquiry unit, we load up the beginning of the unit with all the knowledge that they need, and then we set them free on their actual inquiry questions. So whatever content information they need, that's sort of the basic foundation. So it might be for Scott's class reading about um, Aristotle and Plato's schools of philosophies first, and then doing their exploration. Um, then you set the kids up really nicely. How can Canada help refugees? It's great. When was the Royal Proclamation signed? How do the actions and events of the past impact our identity today? So that goes great with Stan's question about what lessons we can learn from studying the past. And then we have Kinga, grade 11 physics. What is constant velocity? Seems like a closed question. I would need to inquire to figure out the response to that. And then this is interesting. Not a question, but it could mean to inquiry. Design an experiment to test for constant velocity. So that's cool. So lots of different options there in terms of playing, and maybe you already sort of start with this mindset in mind, but how do I design questions that'll sort of drive my unit? But then the other thing might be, can I create a situation in my class where students are choosing the questions that they want to explore? I think that's what eventually we want to move to. It can't happen instantaneously, but I think that's what we want to aspire to if we want to use in pre in our classroom. So I'm going to try to come back to the slideshow. I'm going to stop sharing here. Hopefully it'll allow me to come back. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your responses and being brave about um, putting your questions up there in front of everyone. I know initially in the first week, my students, some of them are a little skeptical about putting them up, but by now we're, we've got a higher comfort level with sharing what we're thinking with everybody. So I don't know if any of you, uh, maybe we can have a show of hands in terms of a check mark or an X. Has anyone heard of Garfield Ginny Newman? You can use the check mark or the X feature. Caitlin has a hand. Would you like to contribute something, Caitlin, or is that is that a yes? Caitlin's heard of Jimmy Newman. Okay, and we have Anne has. Oh, we got a number of people. Okay, Farron, Jennifer, Lori, fantastic. Michelle, Scott. Okay, so I was recently at the Reading for the Love of It conference last week, I think, in Toronto. Garfield Ginny Newman was speaking. This is actually from a presentation. An enthusiastic yes is always appreciated. Um, and 10 years ago, no, eight years ago, I think it was 2010, I think he's a former York Region teacher, history teacher. Um, he did a presentation, and he got to this slide. This is 2010 at um, Betty Stevenson. That's the, the place I was at. And he showed this slide, and I looked up, and I said, that's inquiry for me. That's how I want to design my courses. That's how I want to design my units of study when I saw this slide. I emailed him. He gave me only this slide from the slideshow, which was fantastic. I appreciated it. And it's something that we used initially when we were exploring how we bring inquiry into our courses, into our units of study. So he called this cascading curriculum. And I'm excited that nobody has corrected any spelling error that's in the title, which is fantastic. And we've got this transcendent overall question, which could be for the unit or the course. For whom does the change in regime really matter? And then a question that might be the challenge to the students. So this is, of course, coming from the teacher. It would be great if some questions at some point would come from the students. And then you could almost see the green and this reddish pink and this purple and this gray being, are they going to drive specific lessons? Are they going to drive specific weeks within the course? But you're actually designing your whole course or your whole unit with this idea of these are the questions my students are going to explore, and they're going to discover the curriculum as opposed to me conveying it to them, which is really boring. So no lecturing, 
but we're revealing it. I would explain the processes that I want the kids to go through to discover these things, and maybe we're working in groups or we're working individually or we're working in a class, but this is constructivism, right? The students are discovering, the students are sharing, the students are gathering the knowledge. You could construct the assessment task or the test or the whatever based on what they discovered, what they were learning. Oh, there you go. He was the head of history in my school years ago. There you go. Was that in New York region? I'm going to assume that it was. Okay. So that's courtesy of Garfield, Ginny Newman. And then, no, no response. Okay. So, and here's just basically a template. And again, this is a picture of the template, so it's not the greatest of quality in terms of visibility, but you'll be able to see it in the slideshow afterwards if you take a look. Um, but you're framing with an overall question in mind, and then you've got um, this question that could lead to the challenge. So this is the question that's connected to the assessment of learning. And I could see either blue, green, orange, purple being my four-week unit and a question to drive the week or a question for each individual lesson that we're going to have. If you were going to, oh, there you go, Vaughn Secondary York Region. So we could have individual questions for each lesson. And again, like I said, it would be really cool if the kids could construct some of those questions. So here is my grade nine academic English course. And our course theme, grade nines, new to high school, et cetera. So our course theme for years has been identity. And um, so this overall theme is how is a person's identity formed, and that allows us to access all kinds of different texts, whether it's books or movies, different types of units, whether it's myths, novels, media, et cetera, okay, including Shakespeare sometimes. But that's not really getting at our curriculum expectations in terms of how is a person's identity formed but it's probably a more intriguing question than one that might directly connect to our curriculum. So this enduring understanding that we have, one of them, is this idea of a relationship between the question you're asking and the position you take on that topic. And I think, although we might call it different things in different subject areas, whether it's a hypothesis or a treaty or whatever, um, you could use it probably in different grades and different subject areas, this connection between the question that we start with at the beginning of the process to my response at the end, my position on that topic, which is supported by the evidence that I've gathered, I've discarded some, I've come up with my sort of position on the topic. So this represents the four units of the course that don't include our um, independent study, which overarches the whole thing. So we've got writing, myth, media, and drama, and these are some of the questions we explore. Now, I am not saying that all of them are fantastically amazing in terms of piquing student curiosity. Our writing questions here are helpful to the teacher in terms of understanding what I need to teach during that unit, but maybe not that engaging for the student. Whereas for the myth and the drama unit, we might do better at creating questions that the kids are actually interested in exploring or interested in coming up with their stance or response to them. So this is one model that you can use in terms of how do I bring questions in. And I don't recommend, of course, that we – oh, you're welcome, Anne. I don't recommend that we go, like, I'm going to redesign my entire course with inquiry. But maybe a unit, you know, maybe an assessment task, maybe an assignment. That might be something where you could start. Um, but if you're ambitious, maybe you just go, forget it. I'm going to do the whole course, and I'm going to frame it all with inquiry in mind. These are a couple of different types of lessons. On the left, I don't know about you, but my high school is filled with $2,000 smart boards on, in every classroom, and they are where we shine the LCD projector on top of. I know that the science department and the math department use them really, really well, um, but some of our other departments, including English, it doesn't get used as a smart board. So this was created on the left with smart notebook, 
And at that point, my 85 day lessons for the, each semester, every question, every lesson was driven by a question. So not only were we asking the students to construct questions within their assignments, but we were trying to frame each lesson as a question in terms of something that they could explore. And I also thought it was kind of cool to have a quote for every lesson, but that's just me. On the right, we eventually transitioned to Google Docs. Fantastic thing there being easy to update as opposed to Smart Notebook. I have to download, upload everything when I want to put it on Moodle or Google Classroom or your website. Whereas on the right, I just update the document in Google Docs. And again, this is the first day of school in grade nine academic English. What are the expectations in this subject area? And that was what we were exploring. And I tried to build it in this learning goals agenda success criteria model where we put the curriculum expectations front and center, and in this case, adapt the curriculum expectations. So how do I make them specifically relevant to what we're doing? Yeah, Google Docs, Google Classroom, awesome, love them. Okay, so it's 8.46. We're, I think we're moving fairly rapidly, but I've got to sort of accelerate to get through some of these next things, and then we're going to do a little activity right at the end. Years ago, this is where we started in terms of my English department. Um, I know we're not all in the language arts. These are two good resources. The one on the left, they're by the same author, Jeffrey Wilhelm. The one on the left is more theoretical, and it can help you in terms of wrapping your mind around designing a unit of study. The one on the right has 50 strategies that are specifically for inquiry-based learning. So a lot of them put questions front and center, and we definitely took a number of strategies from this, and we got both of these books for everybody in the department. So that, that was where we started. This was a year-long book study. So I recommend those two for sure. And one of the things we pulled out of here was this idea of this triple Venn diagram. I'm sure lots of us have run into this uh, text-to-reader, text-to-world, text-to-self, et cetera, connections. And what we would do is have them come up with the topic, and they would construct the questions, the questions that were specific to them, the questions that overlapped between reader and world, reader and text, world and text, and then ultimately, what is the overall question that they're inquiring into that all things connect to? And they would put that in the middle. So we actually did three, two, one. Three for each of these outside ones, two for the ones that overlap with two, and then in the middle, they had to have one central question. And again, we gave them the liberty of that evolving over time. They, they weren't trapped when they came up with one question. We used it as a conferencing tool and a number of other things. With grade nine, um, in terms of our English, we now use it with this idea of we have three texts. In the first text, they come up with a number of different topics that they find intriguing. They choose the book. And then from there, they'll choose another book that connects to the same topic. So we must have overlap between book one and book two. And there's a narrowing because book one might have five dominant topics or themes. Book two might have two or three that are common with book one. And by the time they get to book three, they've got one topic. They've come up with their overall inquiry question in the middle, and that's what they do their presentation on at the end of the five months is, you know, how do relationships survive? You know, so how does a family function? They come up with different questions, and we usually try to have them be how, why, or what questions. And this is our Genius Hour project. And we have them start with a nonfiction text, then a multimedia text, and then the real trick, accessing an expert in the particular field. So we've got really interesting topics that the kids are coming up with, and they have to find a current expert in that field, and that's a challenge, and that's something that we have to support them with, and we also have to support them with how you communicate with that expert but it's cool, the kids love it. This was our second book study. Um, so it is applicable to everybody. It focuses a lot on constructing questions, so it could be useful for you in terms of wrapping your mind around it, and it could be useful for 
the kids in terms of some of the strategies there. So it's very useful. And here we have a question for you that I'll just randomly throw up in the middle of nowhere. Does anybody know who this person is? Oh, Cheryl Lynn must know. Yes, I just saw his new book publicized on Twitter, actually. Fantastic. So this is Trevor McKenzie, and he's probably a big reason why a lot of people are coming back to Inquiry right now. And this is Dive Into Inquiry, which I really recommend for everybody, anybody. Short, I think it's less than 200 pages. The problem with my department is we've been inquired out. We had drank the Kool-Aid a long time ago, so we were all infusing it. I love the book, but I think the rest of my department was going, Derek, seriously? A fourth book study? Like, give it a rest. So love it. Highly recommend it. Fantastic. And I will be reading his new book as well. Um, and what this does, which is really cool, is he has videos in the book and of student work that he's engaged in inquiry. And he's got a lot of student testimonials in terms of how they began their inquiry, what type of choices they made. So I think it's fantastic for some people who are wanting to bring this into their classroom. So this is one of his quotes. The most powerful shift you can make in adopting inquiry into your practice is to begin learning with the question. And I think we've seen that questions as being central from the very beginning of this webinar. And this is a great place to start. So he has taken someone else's idea in terms of different forms of inquiry, and you can consider where you want to start with your kids. Does it, do you want to be structured and have the teacher lead, teacher choose the topic, teacher choose the questions? Do you want to be controlled? Maybe you provide the topics and the resources, and your kids inquire. This might be a good place to start initially. Then we've got here, guided inquiry, teacher choose topics or questions, students design the product or solution. Our group's trying to get brave with that to open up the option for the student product. And then we're often sort of in the right in terms of free inquiry. We're kind of in the deep end, and I think we actually could do a better job of having them uh, swim with an adult before we throw them in the deep end. So, yeah, it's fantastic. So students choose their topics without reference to any prescribed income. What we have is students choose their topics, students choose their questions. We're moving to students uh, construct their own products. But I think it's interesting in terms of the, the different kids in the pool doing different things. I'm assuming that these two are actually bobbing up and down and not sinking. Um, but, yeah. So this is different options for you in terms of how you want to approach in creating your class. This is another um, idea from him. Lee Arias on Twitter also has his own ideas in terms of different options for how we sort of access or begin inquiry. So this would be more along the lines of that free inquiry to the right. So students are responsible for choosing their topic and how they're going to be inspired. Am I exploring something I already do? Um, so we had students focusing on things connected to, you know, hockey or concussions or sports or whatever. I had students um, last semester, one student focused on learning sign language. That was the goal that she had. And what was really cool is we have them construct little artifacts along the way. So there's one where she's engaging in a first dialogue with somebody as a video in uh, sign language. And then later on, which was really cool, she sings a song and signs it at the same time. You know, I can't even sing. And she can actually sing and actually sign all of the words at the same time, which I thought was really cool. So delve into existing curiosities, take on a new challenge. So th these, again, are options if you don't want to sort of present one unified thou shalt, you can give kids different access. And you might want to sit there and do some sort of brainstorm activity with them first, generate a ton of ideas, and then have them pick, because some kids are going to find it tougher than others to come up with ideas. Here we have a little path. Um, we have constructing the questions, definitely conferencing along the way. 
collecting learning evidence we call them artifacts in our particular um, genius hour that we played with last semester and then the challenge is building enough time into your unit for a course for creating something authentic and again we have this key how am I going to share it I shouldn't be as the teacher the only one who sees this work how can I share it with other classes how can I share it at least with the students in my class how can I share it with parents are we comfortable with it being online so these are questions that you're going to have to answer in terms of how do I get that big payoff at the end that's going to push them into the next cycle of inquiry. So I think we are approaching, yeah, a little bit of the end here. So these are some ideas for you in terms of how you do that authentic sharing, accessing an authentic audience, getting real feedback. Uh, with my e-learning class, one thing we do is we do blogs so that everything's online and people can access it that way. Another great tool um, is Flipgrid in terms of constructing videos, and you can make it so that the videos are just visible within your classroom, okay, where people can explain their learning along the way. You can almost act, almost act as a video conference. But we've got a number of different ideas. In our grade 10 class, we use social media. Uh, the students actually use it, which is fantastic. You can connect to higher and lower grades. You can connect to your elementary or secondary school program. So there's lots of different options, but this is really important in terms of maximizing the value out of the process. So I think I've gone really fast. I haven't had a lot of questions, which is interesting and scary at the same time. Um, but what we're going to do, yeah, connect with reading buddies. Absolutely. It's a cool idea. What we're going to do is we're going to do a just a little review activity here at the end, and, uh, and then we'll take any final questions and we'll go. So we're going to do a little Kahoot, and um, I'm going to warn you that it's 10 seconds for each question, so you have to be on your toes. Hopefully the tablet and phone people can participate. And we'll just, I'll just go there really quick. Okay, and I'm going to choose classic mode because I don't think we're going to form into teams here. Okay, so if you want to join, you have to type it, you have to go to Kahoot online and type in this game pin. And this is a little video that's about inquiry based learning. And again, this is a resource that you can access later. Trish will share it with you with all of the other resources. So, so far we've got two players. Anyone else brave enough at 8.58? We've got three, we've got four, we've got five. So I have to choose Harry Potter here because we're going to Universal Studios for March break and my son needs to watch all eight movies consecutively. I think we're on movie four or five tonight after this, even though he should be in bed. So we have nine players. I don't want to exclude anybody. I'm not sure if the game pin will show up if I start it, but I think in the nature of time, I think we're going to get started. So sometimes four answers are correct. Sometimes it's just one or two. What are characteristics of inquiry-based learning? Be brave. We might start off with the easy yes. Okay. So all of these different components are connected to inquiry for sure. Learning process, we have questions, student-centered, student engagement, and then we really want it to be authentic. Farron is winning. Only one answer is correct in this little question. Hopefully the picture helps you out. The primary traits, yes. So the idea is we know kids are curious about things they're interested in, so we need to try to bring that into our classroom if possible. Farron is still winning. Jay might be making a comeback, we'll see. The role of the teacher in an inquiry-based learning model. 
Only one answer is correct. Well, we have 11 people telling it's good. 11 people got it right. It must be the amazing teaching. It must be. Karen is still winning, but Kinga is close behind. And we have Julia in fifth. What can be differentiated for students with inquiry? And we have a little bit of a flashing light bulb here. Okay. So we're all correct, so it was just a matter of speed there. How can students be more involved in inquiry-based learning? I think only two answers are correct. We have Sylvia Duckworth's beautiful images. You should check her out on Twitter. She's fantastic. Okay. So it was a little bit tricky. Only two were right. Will anyone be able to defeat Aaron? What type of questions may provoke inquiry? Only one answer is correct for this. Oh, we have some confident respondees. We have 12 people playing now. Okay, so we're aiming for those open-ended questions to get them to dig deep into their topic. And we've got four questions left. I think Caitlin helped us out with this partway through the webinar. Which ones are sort of our best options? Not the only options, but maybe the best options. So we have why and how. Everybody got it. It's close. Anne is right there behind you, Karen. Look out. What are different types of inquiry? This might be a speed answer. Be fast. Can't be wrong. That was sort of a hint. Okay. So this is courtesy of Trev McKenzie. There we go. You can easily find all of those images online. Two questions left. Where can you introduce inquiry in your classroom? I would be fast on this one as well. Oh, right at the end, leading by six. Final question. How is student learning in an inquiry model different from a traditional classroom? There's a lot of reading there if you read all four of them. Okay. So that's what we're aiming for, ideally, with inquiry. Curriculum is discovered and explored by the students. And, oh, Farron retains the lead at the end. What happened to Ann? Okay, so we have Kinga second and Michelle in third. Okay, so we're going to, congratulations, Farron. I'm going to try to get back to the room. And that wraps up what we're doing. Uh-oh, Ann hit the wrong button. So thank you guys for coming tonight. I hope this was a little bit of a dip into what inquiry is. I hope there's some great resources for you and that you pursue it and try it out. Don't, don't wait. I think what happens with these types of professional development is we need to play soon or it kind of we forget it and we might never come back. So attempt on a small scale. And thanks, everybody, for participating. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks, Trish, for all your help as well. No problem. Yeah. Thanks, Derek. That was fabulous. Thought-provoking. So many great examples. Lots of good starting points for everyone. And uh, thank you to everyone in the audience tonight. Good participation. That always adds for presentations. Um, that's my feedback, but we need yours, most importantly. So that is the link right there for you. Um, you can click on it on the slide, or I'll also put it in there. I'm not sure why I got extra stuff there. Um, feedback link for you. Once you do it, finish up the feedback, you'll be prompted to uh, receive a certificate, and that's nice for you to have afterwards as well. I also want to uh, stop the recording now, and uh, I'll just have a few more things to say.